thank you all for joining i think we can start now everyone uh, how are you feeling today so it's the day 2 and um, we had a beautiful uh, keynote yesterday as well as today there are a lot of booths so did you got a chance to explore and move around uh, with the sponsors did not expect it uh, the way i imagined it would go thank you um cool so uh let's get started so let's get started today uh, i'll be basically talking about how you can do testing in production without writing any test cases or preparing uh, before hand synthetic data mocks whether using uh, llm models such as chat gpt or uh, gemini uh, they are doing a very good results on the synthetic data but it still um, comes uh, comes at the point of a copyright right so let's get started i have uh, I'll introduce myself. So, who am I? Uh, I'm Animesh Patak. I work as a DevRel at Keploy. I'm also one of the core maintainers who, uh, with the Keploy, we are what we are building. Previously, I worked as a software engineer and API engineer at companies such as Typeoff, Reskill, which is mostly an e-commerce and uh, event management platforms. And before I shifted to developer advocacy or DevRel um, domain. with commerce and server labs so most of the times when i'm not doing um the devrel and traveling i like to play around with the new oss projects that are coming up in both the cncf as well as uh, outside such as prisma drizzle recently i was tinkering around arcade so that's why sort of a tinker not a real builder but i can play around very well and break things so that's a perk for me especially i am in the uh, testing industry that's why So you guys can find me um, on Twitter. I go by the name Sony Chigo. Uh, that's not my real name, but it's a fancy nickname that um, took a role, kind of. So sticking with it. So um, how many of uh, you have written or still write test cases and do not like them? Can you show your hands? I am one of them. Yeah, I still am one of them. <laughs> um so a couple of months back i was building on a site project um and uh, for a feedback on how uh, basically they are liking it with the developers and during that time i came across the three pain problems once back again any guesses not just testing yeah definitely a testing uh, but the problem was uh, they had very strict timelines they have to deliver their feature within a, sp a same sprint it should be properly tested and it should no bugs should be released in the production but all these three was failing um they had to deliver the half big functions and features uh without any proper uh, testing and then the customers were reporting okay this is not working the way it um, should be how many of you remember uh, c sharp back in early 20s there used to be a beautiful form uh in which uh, we can write our details basically get up uh, the sign up forms and such people used to write anything that a developer can't think of right and then uh, once it breaks you are the one who's responsible so and that's why the uh, so i created this beautiful chart i'm not sure sure how many of you are liking it but this is how it generally goes right uh we try to figure out um if the current features are in sync with the ones that we are actually releasing into the production and once the that check is done then comes our second most hurdle that's to test that features actually being a developer we uh, developers we generally don't want to uh create unit test cases it's very time consuming thing right and then we have to prepare our data mocks accordingly if it's a live instance we bring up the live instance work with the test cases and then uh, shut downs and then it passes on to the other teams or other devs who write the integrations before releasing it to the production but this has never um, helped anyone this flow why because first of all whatever we create it's always brittle right uh the test cases or the test automation scripts that we are writing is for the current scope uh, based on the current scope of the requirements and the feature that we are building on and as soon as there is a new iteration the code base may be changed a little bit there came uh, unknown variable our test scripts would break that's that's how fragile and brittle they are same with our synthetic data mocks so no matter how much we prepare or how much we add with our uh, default values or maybe playing around with json's uh, llms uh, they do not actually help a lot 
because first they are not even really close to the what database fields scope that we are getting from the uh, production plus most of the teams have their test environment shared so if someone maybe changed a schema um, added new fields or database configurations again it would break and as we can see at the third slide people break their hearts and head as well so and as a developer i want only three things if i'm writing uh, or uh, better if uh, my test cases scripts or test scripts can be auto generated it's very helpful for me and if they are easy and up there easy to maintain and create that's a beautiful right plus um, if i'm if i'm using data mocks and not the real life dependency it should be replicable of the re uh, closest that's what is uh, what is in the production so how many of you agree with this actually or we are on a different page <laughs> we are on a different page Okay, <laughs> so uh, that's where we actually ex we were explaining our solutions, uh, what to do and what not to do, and then we came up with the most crazy idea yet. Uh, why not we directly do testing in production? If it's break, it, it's gonna break in the production. So, <laughs> but yeah, actually it makes sense. We want our test environment to be ideal scenario where we can check or uh, test our features maybe some couple of on how it's going to behave with the real life users right so let's take an example of uh, shadow testing and i'll walk you through a couple of approaches that we tried so uh, this is our application v1 uh, let's uh, we try to create uh, like we created another version with the application v2 while v1 was in production and what we did uh, we try we used service mesh to just replicate or mirror the live traffic and then we were comparing the request and response for both of application v1 and application v2 now the problem here was these are just the start uh, stateless, uh, stateless applications um, mostly we were comparing okay um, we had a json demp and then that's how we were comparing but this did not work well when we introduced a couple of dependencies whether it was uh, twilio mongodb and the stripe for the payment gateways then we thought okay how we can do or improvise on this. Then came another uh, <laughs> crazy idea. We directly connected our application V2 with the production database and we're uh, doing the uh, checks. The problem here, uh, first problem that came up was uh, we can only do one operations and expect same initial response. So if I was testing something at the 1 p.m., right it would change at the second pm because the initial request and request is same but the response would be different so there's no guarantee that it would always send me the same response that's why we introduced a filter proxy which were only doing the read um, write uh, read uh, api writes so for example if i had a get api or i was fetching something from database it uh, those were my happy cases at least something now started to make sense and were working but again i was not able to do uh, write operations delete uh, write operations updates and anything because in that scenario if i wanted some kind of mutations to check uh, what's working and not that wasn't still possible and then we uh, increased our costs before the team cut off us uh, <laughs> so uh, what we did we created a shadow database based on our production database and connected our application v2 directly to our um, the second database that's what we will call it and we try to maintain it in the sync so whatever as soon as the new data were coming or in the production one we set up the cron job and then we were uh, at a certain interval trying to keep it as much as we can um, in the sync but that's not how the life goes right everything how we expect so again uh, problem one it was very expensive since we were using um, the cost of the dependencies just went twice x plus uh, there are certain uh, dependencies that were charging us more for just doing based on the request that we were um, sending to them plus uh, still there was a replication lag now this created this was initially not as expected uh, the impact that would have but um, we got our database corruption <laughs> um, why because um, for example if the database is in the sync 
right? It's synced at the time and the traffic, duplicate traffic from uh, is coming to the application V2. Those would pass because now the database are in the sync. I would get the same response. But um, as we were doing at a certain period of interval, it was not very uh, feasible for us to keep it synced throughout the day at uh, every minute. So that's why we what we fa uh, that's what we face. So we had to delete our um, and then recreate and keep the snapshots of it, and then we attached uh, the things. So again, uh, this was breaking for us. That's why we thought uh, there's one thing that we can do. Let's test in production, but just record the traffic from the production and replay it in the non-product environment. And that's how we came up with the Kepler. Um, what we do, a uh, brief introduction. Also, well, before that, how many of you are familiar with Kepler? Okay. Um, <laughs> nice, that's nice. So here's a brief intro of what we do. We basically record all the interactions that are happening in the real time to your applications and then captures it, uh, captures it and at the you can replay it in your non-prod environment or any isolated environment if you want because we don't need actually any dependencies. Uh, why? Yeah, I'll come back to that. So that's how we are working. Um, we create a virtual database based on the data mocks that we are creating. So um, you don't need your any instance, whether it's a database instance, whether it's your uh, application instance, maybe Twilio APIs, um, we'll just replicate it. So that's how we are doing. But there was one challenge that we faced. Since at, um, since at a very early stage, we were not able to figure out how to do this smoothly. So we went back to the SDK implementations. We were building SDKs for each language, and then we had to add dependencies, um, protocol dependencies, wrappers for each one of them. So this got again hard for us, as well as from both the DevX experience and the UX experience because it was not very feasible to add each version of dependency as soon as they comes in. Plus, we had to add the support for each framework. We have to create the SDKs for each uh, languages that people are using and make sure that with the new updates, with the new releases, um, it works fine. And we had a very quite a challenge with the Java. Um, so what worked with us in Java 15 did not work in the Java 17. And if we made it stable for Java 17, by that people were started using the Java 21. So this created a bit of hassle for us. And to again, keep telling them, okay, now it's not working, please update it or use this specific versions. That's where we got introduction with the eBBF. So we had um, initial plans to move, uh, to not, to deprecate at certain point the SDKs and then move to the agent implementation on, but how we were not able to finalize on um, what's the right way. So after a lot of research and R&Ds, uh, we started with the eBPF. We are using these uh, basic three calls, um, accept, read, write, and uh, synonyms to the language specific ones, such as uh, receive from, write, sees, and send to. So how it works, we are sending, um, from the server, it first uh, we start our client um, server uh, processes, and then waits for um, till we are able to accept any calls from the client. Once um, client is able to establish a connection with the server, then again our uh, accept calls um, gets blocked because we have already got our file descriptors. So far, any questions? No one. Am I that boring? <laughs> Just check in. So yeah, once we were able to establish our connections um, and our accept call, uh, we got our accept connections. We were able to do server and client communication between them. Um, we tried to implement it in the parallel. So not just it works with your single application at a time, but you can run multiple applications simultaneously and test them. So this is how the architecture looks like. So uh, for example, if I take a, uh, I think we all have used curl at some point, right? Or the shell scripts. Anyone who has not used curl? I think I'm asking the wrong questions, but okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, let's take an example of curl. Um, I have made some requests that 
uh, it's a simple fetch request based on um, student. Uh, let's take an example of that. So I am fetching a name. It sends a request to my servers, then the database uh, sends a response and then that has the flow. Um, Kepler acts as a proxy in between them. At a different different state, uh, it, attacks, it attaches its hooks to those specific system calls, listens to them, and then stores it to them in the YML format. So this is just for the incoming. The outgoing process was very hard for me to uh, create the architecture for because there are multiple dependencies and um, we are tracing. Um, there is a different architecture for an implementation for how we are doing for them. Uh, in certain cases, but the most common one that we are uh, doing is for the headers because each protocol has their headers and basis on that, we are able to identify, okay, whether this is a MySQL, whether it's a Mongo, whether it's a Dynamo and uh, more. And with that, we were able to not just um, work with Java, Go, but also the languages such as C Sharp and the Rust because uh, to be honest, I'm a Rust preferred. Uh, coming from Go, I think Rust is better than Go. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so, but we were able to support and without very really much hassle because now, since you don't have to create any, um, add any SDKs into your projects, which was previously into SDK implementations, then uh, ID levels, yeah. So previously as um, in SDK approaches, although it was easy for us um, to just map the dependencies because we were tracing, okay, we had support for only specific ones and it was very easy for ID to work with IDEs and capture and get the access to the application context runtime. But with eBPF, we actually got a lot more. <laughs> so uh, since now you don't need any SDK or any code changes, whether it's your application such as uh, the primary four and the Rust and C sharp, but even to the um, child languages, that's what I consider them through the Kotlin and Scala. Um, I hope there are no Kotlin and Scala developers here. Okay. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's how we were able to not just extend the capabilities of testing to uh, the base four languages or the common four and six languages, but to their child frameworks and uh, as well. And plus it was very fast for us to, for, fast for us as well as the users to adopt because there was now zero learning curve that they need. They just need to install it as a CLI and then get started how they generally use with the Git, which the developers are uh, familiar with. Plus the overall cost develop, uh, the cost went uh, like, uh, drip, took a drip uh, because now, um, both the sprint cycles as well as the effort to spend um, during the whole testing processes went by approximately 60 percent. That's how we are calculating it based on uh, papers that we have uh, working on. Yep. Um, the reason of the 60 percent is here uh, because now we don't need to write anything. We don't have to um, make any changes into our code base. Um, plus the test environment setup for each level of testing, whether it's a unit test, integration, or just working with the UI front. Who's excited for the demo? I'm happy at this point, <laughs> legit. So let me know if my screen is visible. I meant, uh, <laughs> is it clear? Till the back? So this is our uh, sample application that I built in morning. It's mostly a uh, simple CRUD application that is connecting with Mongo for different, different, um, mostly it does store um, and uh, delete things. So let's go. I'll bring my Uh, so let's get me started. The benefit of um, the ABPF implementation actually came up uh, a lot because now you can uh, record from the production itself. 
So live traffic, that's uh, that is some hosted somewhere. All, all, all you need to do is just provide the command to start your application. And since most of us use Docker in the production stage, the command became very simple. It's a Docker compose up or Docker container run. Sorry, Docker run. Yeah, uh, but that's a. So let me get started. I have already, uh, okay, supported. Oh, sorry. Yep, so I got listening to port 80,000 and connected with the MongoDB. So now I know my application is actually accepting any responses. And previously, beforehand, I have created a script. Um, so I am basically creating two new students, uh, like two new users into the database with on the basis of their email, phone number and such. Then I try to fetch them. I have kept a slip of two seconds um, so that actually we can see on how it's uh, working um, directly into the terminal. So as soon as the request comes in, uh, we'll see um, when it was captured, basically to the timestamps. So these are my six curl commands. I'll just take it. Yep, and let's go back to this. So as soon as um, the API calls are being made to my application, and um, the Kepler is able to capture them, and we can see here, that we got uh, those in a YML format. So this is the data mocks uh, for the Mongo, since my dependency was Mongo. What calls the, my application made with the Mongo? I got the list of them as well, as well as my queries. So let me search name John. Yep. So I got the complete query in search student documents name, which made it very easy for me um, to actually explore if in the case it fails. So I'll just show a demo um, again, I'll run the same curl commands again to show uh, uh, if the things break, how would they break. So um, this made things easier for me to explore, okay, maybe if the, this parameter changed, that's why my existing test is breaking. And I can just go update, search for the field and update them. So let's go and create one more. and then make some changes with test case 12. Yep. So this is how our test case actually looks like. It captures uh, the headers and the origin from where that curl request or that request to your server has been initialized and as well as what response it got. Originally, we got 400 that I have changed it to. So originally, it was 400. I have changed it to 201. Let's see on how that goes. As well as uh, the body that I got, um, if there was any bad request, timestamp, where it got, uh, like the things came in. And then we have a noise. So let me just remove this as well. So uh, what noise does is it identifies the factors that are always changing. It could be your JWT tokens. Um, after it expires, you don't need it actually just for the authentication purpose. So those things won't be considered while you run your test. Since uh, these are the generally things that uh, leads to the failure of your um, like negative test result. Let me close it. Now I'll run the same thing, but with start mode. Also, I no longer need my Mongo. So I'll close that. I'll just clear it. Yep. 
So uh, let me first go to the above one. Okay, there are lots. Yep. So two things I have removed. Uh, one was the noise, and the second was our uh, the status codes. So now we can see if the status code was not 400 um, and so the status code where it was actually 200 it is now using 400 as well as I can see what failed where it failed and what is the actual response that I got. Make sense? Everyone is happy to see uh, the test case is failing. Actually uh, why don't you raise a hand if you actually want to see the test case is failing rather than the test case passing. <laughs> Only a couple of them. May I know the reason why you want to see your test cases fail? So you know your test works. <laughs> That's actually a great answer. So now we know uh, our application works and my test cases are failing uh, because I have actually changed it and it's easy. So let me go apart. I'll do one thing. Now I'll remove the original ones. Keep them same. Let me create a new fresh. Okay. This time, let's try with couple of different test suits and see. Sorry. So this time, uh, let's try out with a different couple of suits. I'll first try my simple six, um, uh, the curl commands that I made, and then let's uh, try something to create with the schema file. So this is how my schema file looks like. We'll go there in a bit. Uh, by the way, this is by the OpenAI and OpenAI schema based. So you, if you want, you can modify it. Um, <laughs> this is my application schema file. Uh, could not make a PID in time, so sorry. And then we'll use uh, the same commands, but with the schema file and see on how in that manner, what else is required from us. Okay, my application is working. Let's go and make some curl commands. Yep, good. Clear this. This time I'm not changing anything. So we can see uh, with the, those simple six commands, uh, six curl commands with the different parameters and trying out with the errors one, um, where I created same thing twice, so duplicate errors were there. Uh, we were able to get the 66.7% of coverage. And I'm not really sure with the industry standards on what you follow in your orgs, but I think 66 with the six commands are still pretty fine, right? So let's go and try it a bit. I think my, yep, it's on. Sorry, my bad. Still did not work. Uh, okay, I'll try and debug it in a while. Uh, but let's come back to our demo. So these are the current scopes on what we have worked around so that your test cases can be directly generated from the production data if the real time, uh, if you're, it's hosted whether in a Helm charts or maybe with the AWS, what you can do, you can install Kepler as a sidecar 
um, and then work around um, and then I'd basically attach and will be able to capture your the traffic that's coming to your application as well as uh, since as I showed we don't have to set up any mock environments test environments or synthetic data all those will be created from your live capture uh, live traffic so that's a plus point uh, and I think I just showed with the six commands, we were able to get 66.7 percent of coverage. So I think that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, I'll just try it in a bit. Uh, we can maybe start with Q and A's. But uh, what I wanted to show was uh, how you can create or reach up to 90, 80 to 90 percent without uh, you know doing the hassle of the fourth and back and maybe frustrations. Um, these are the future works that we're actively working on. We are adding uh, uh, support from the Helm charts, so you can visualize and work around with it. This year, we got ex um, accepted into GSOC. So and <laughs> our mentors and mentee have done a great job to create a contract testing since we are already able to capture requests and compare them with the actual things. So it's going to be live up soon. Um, plus, data streaming is something that we are actively working on. We got a lot of feedback from the community to add the support for WebSockets, Kafka, and RabbitMQ. And since the, those are the things that generally people use while working with uh, enterprise-grade applications. Plus, uh, we already had uh, support for outgoing gRPC. Now we are actively adding the support for incoming gRPC calls. So that's all. Um, thank you. Uh, we would love to have you on our community. Uh, uh, we are an open source company, so if you can give us a star mark, that's great. And as well as we are always on a Slack. Um, that's all. I think we are open for Q&A. Yep. So anyone has any questions? Yeah, so uh, the problem right now is here we support only from the si uh, server side since uh, it was uh, like we did a lot of experiment, but um, we're not, we are still finding on how to uh, like create a complete parser. It's already working for, as I mentioned, the outgoing calls. Uh, now all we need for is the incoming calls. So if, if anyone is uh, interested, they can contribute to that. So uh, we are basically using uh, leveraging the existing libraries. Um, in this case, we are using NYC. Um, for Go, it's pretty simple. So we are just leveraging the Go test. Java, right now we are working with a J unit, but adding uh, for the test in as well and other uh, applications. For Python, it's again the Python native library. What we try to do, uh, the format, so we are basically passing everything, the test cases. Please, please in because there's a sure, stream going on. Hello? Audible? Cool. So um, right now what we are doing, we uh, send, uh, once the test cases are actually created, we pass it in the format that is accessible or recognized by those native libraries. And then we are running, so pretty much it's the simple same thing that you do npm run coverage and you get your coverage file right. It's same thing, nothing much more complicated. We just pass it into the format um, that is accessible, readable, and identified by the native libraries. I think what he was asking was what what what, what coverage are you actually measuring? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, so right now we are actually measuring the code coverage on, uh, and we are trying to add for the uh, branch and functional as of branch and statements right now. No, I mean the coverage of what? Because if you're testing something. Oh, uh, that's a complete application code coverage. So you still have to have your application instrumented to do the code coverage there so you're you're not no no um so i'll show so i'll keep this <coughs> yeah 
um so i have not instrumented i have just added into the like nyc format and such what i'll do this was in case if you already have any existing unit test cases that's where actually uh, you need to uh, find out and the things work but you don't need to change anything um, pretty much everyone uses nyc directly and it dumps your uh, coverage uh, coverage data into jsons you can get those in the jsons and that's how we utilize it my other question was you said you didn't need to write any test cases but the test cases are what you're what you're actually running in the first place you're just recording something mm -hmm. where you've actually de you've actually defined the test case yourself can you speak or like sorry yes. um you're still having to devise the test cases that you're running in the first place you're just able to record them conveniently so how does this how does this help with that oh uh, i think that's a bit a uh, long discussion i'm running out of time we'll have it just after this would that work cool thank you uh, but yeah i'll come back to that uh, any more okay oh we have one more uh, a question regarding to the en encryption so can a uh, employee uh, capture encrypted uh, data um, de decrypt it and uh, and send the uh, encrypted data back to the uh, back end or front end Mm, so right now uh, the scram authentication mechanism is only implemented in the case of database um, and the tls is only for http passes basically we have we have kept it very generic but as the dependencies or the request comes in of if someone creates an issue we'll work on those um, uh, the probable reason is because when we were doing the uh, the parser thing then when we were writing the parser thing what we came across each of the dependencies does the tls handshake at the different point of time in certain cases it was just before uh, they were establishing the connection um, most probable case in mongo and in some it was uh, in between uh, uh, while working with the mysql and such so we are still not able to uh, find where we can get that tls part come uh, where does it, that comes in and how we can pass it but since http is a pretty simple one it works for it okay thanks so i was uh, in the cases where you were um where you're working with user data have you considered adding any form of anonymization for it so uh, we are uh, still we have tried to mask the data but it's actually not up to us what request and response we are coming in we are trying to add the, that factor to redact the information um, but in the, right now in the current scenario since um, it will be run by the developers in the organizations they know what sensitive data is being um, coming in so they can just uh, add it to the noise so it won't be considered again and will be removed from your test cases another way is to normalize it so normalize is a feature um, kind of what uh, we, we want to implement how it's working it's basically you add uh, the fake credentials maybe xyz abcd and credit card basic dummy uh, credit card informations and then normalize your test suite completely so next time it won't uh, it will use those dummy datas or um, the fake credentials that you have provided and then use to uh, run your test cases so in that case you, it won't plus it's a cli um, it will pretty much running on by uh, on the prems of whatever organizations plus the developers so uh, it's up to them yeah cool uh, anyone else have any questions cool. i think uh, we are good to go then I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you have a great day at um, the, for the talks that are uh, being there and at the booths. Um, thank you for joining and thank you for uh, not getting bored by me. <laughs>